You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. I'm here. And guess who else is here? Bryce. Bryce has uh, done a couple of Talkville episodes. She's now on an Inside of You intro episode because Ryan is uh, on a camping trip yep. with his dad. Ryan's on a camping trip with his father. Something I would never do with my father. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. A lot going on, man. Um, just briefly, I want to thank you for listening. If uh, you're here for Helen Slater, you've come to the right place. If you enjoy the podcast, uh, we think we're different than any, ever, any other podcast. We talk about mental health. We talk about life with celebrities. It's just not fluff. And if you dig it, we'd love your help because the support really helps us. We're not a huge podcast, but we're growing. And uh, write a review. Um, subscribe. And if you want to join Patreon to help the show, go to patreon.com slash inside of you p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash inside of you really helps the show and uh without the patrons i i wouldn't be here also the uh we got the inside of you online store with tons of cool merch and tumblers i just got these new inside of you jackets uh little sweat zip ups they're they're dope they're selling out so get one and uh cool new tumblers and uh autographed pictures and scripts and blah 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 and uh yeah it's a lot of fun. I'll be in Salt Lake City, D.C. and uh, Rhode Island in September with Tom. We're going to do an evening with Michael and Tom. We're going to do a lot of stuff, sign pictures, all that. I'm on the Cameo and uh, the Inside of You online store, cool merch. I said uh, my band, Sunspin.com, uh, we're selling vinyls. They just came out. Vinyls. There's only 99 signed um, by me and Rob and numbered. Um, love the support. You um, didn't do 100? You did 99? 99, because we, we we kept one. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, 98, because we kept one each. Gotcha. Actually, 97, because I gave my mom one. There's only 97. 96, actually. I gave Tom one. There's only 90. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we appreciate it. We worked really hard on the album, and we're really proud of it, and I think you'll be uh, surprised. So have a listen, if you will. Sunspin. We're on Spotify. We're everywhere else, and uh, we're playing music um, at the end of every month on stageit.com. You can get tickets and listen to us. That would mean the world to me. Uh, our guest today is Helen Slater. She's been in so many things, but she has so many fantastic stories about Supergirl and working with Christopher Reeve. And uh, just what did you like about this podcast? I like that she was open about her experience early. She Because she came into Supergirl at like, what, 18 years yeah. old or something? So she got thrown into the limelight super early. Oof. Um, I would have fallen apart. And at a different age, right? There's no social media or anything. So it was really interesting hearing that perspective. And then also her her fascination and her interest in education. Yeah. And uh, I think it was like mythology that she's really into. She's not what you would think from super, yeah. which is cool. She's really smart. And also on top of it, what's amazing is she talks, those are my dogs, but she talks about Helen Hunt, her best friend mm -hmm. and Helen Hunt. You know, she tells Helen, like I saw some, uh, some video of a movie I did and she's like, Helen, I look so old and wrinkly. And she was like, when she saw footage and Helen looked at her and said, sweetheart, we're dying, <laughs> which is so profound and funny, but we're dying. We're all dying. We're all getting old. We're all aging. When we're born, we're just aging until we end up dying. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was kind of beautiful and I apologize for my dogs, but I don't because I, it's a puppy and all right, without further ado, Let's just get into it. Let's get inside of Helen Slater. It's my point of view. You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience. Hey, folks. Wanted to highlight something important before today's episode. In case you weren't aware, myself and many of the guests are on strike alongside SAG, after and WGA. Today's episode and any we air before the strike ends were recorded before it began. So this is just a heads up in relation to some for the topics we may discuss. If you want more info on the strike, visit SAGAfterStrike.org. Now let's get into it. I mean, I just graduated a myth program. So of course the images and the icons in this room are totally a fascinating to me. You are they just like, you just collect what you want or is there reason, is there things that? I think there's something that has to do with nostalgia. 
oh. from a certain time period of just like going, oh my gosh, I remember this moment with my friend Dave Bukert watching Return of the Living Dead in Louisville in his basement. Or I remember my mom making me watch this movie with her right and being scared or the first time i saw the evil dead like I, I always was a big horror movie fan i've talked about this but like it's funny because people assume since i played lex luther i was the flash i'm in the guardians of the galaxy world that oh i'm i'm big in marvel and dc i know nothing yeah i, I had that about less. the dc world when i did supergirl did you know nothing nothing did you have to look into it or you're like no i'm not doing that well, I was 18 when I got the part, Oy. and it, we had much less access. I mean, I love Superman as a <laughs> yeah, kid. That's good. Have we started? Oh, yeah. We, we oh, always, we have? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we just talk. It's just kind of like this is like, you know, oh. I like it when it's just like sort of fly on the wall. I want people to feel like they're a fly on the wall and we're just two people talking. Good. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Now you were just talking about you, you're getting a degree, your master's in what? My PhD. I got my master's last. Oh, so master's. This is what I know. Master's comes before PhD. Right. Oh, okay. So it's bachelor or you know art, whatever. What is it? it took Undergrad. me thirteen years to get my bachelor's degree because I started working right out of performing arts high school, the Fame High School in Manhattan. I just boom got Supergirl that September after I graduated in June in 1982. So, and everything was about, I come from a family where education is everything. And I always just had this kind of shame wound around education. Really? It just was like, oof, my mom went to back to law school at 42. My brother's an attorney. My stepmother's the first woman dean of students at Princeton. My stepsisters went to Yale. And I mean, just like education is everything. So it was always there. And then I just wow. wasn't working as much and had the time to do it and slowly made my way through Valley College right near in the Valley yeah. and got the AA and then graduated from Antioch and then went to Pacifica Graduate Institute in their myth program, which is incredible. This is a big shout out for, well, education, like but you, that program. Yeah, myth, mythological. You think of like, like, like what, the Loch Ness Monster and things? <laughs> like, I mean, are we thinking like mythological? Is, is that what that is? Like, I mean, sure, that comes from, I don't know the full history of that myth, but Greek and Roman myth, uh, and then world stuff. mythology, Norse, African mythology, um, Egyptian. We covered as much Agamemnon. as you can. In the, for sure. We read Ooh. the Odyssey and the Iliad. and Clytemestra. For sure. She was not very nice no, to Agamemnon. She was not very nice. <laughs> I remember reading those things in, in college, and yeah. they were interesting. And I wrote an album called The Myths of Ancient Greece before I even went to school that took like my six favorite ones, Narcissus and Echo and Psyche and Eros and Demeter and Persephone and couple of others wow. and and turned them into like mini musicals because that's what I had done at Performing Arts High School. That and, was kind of my... And you have an album yeah. of that. What's it called? The Myths of Ancient Greece. The Myths of Ancient Greece. And yeah. you think like <laughs> who, like I'm not, this isn't a knock. This is like, I, what I love is that you do what you want to do. This is my passion. Whether or not people really listen to it, I don't yeah. think is really your... At some point, I think we all have that kind of pivot of like, I actually want, I'm only here so briefly, like yeah. how do I bring meaning to this life? And how do you navigate that if the world's not reflecting it back? Do you keep going with that thing that's inside? So... Yeah, yeah. I, I, I battle that, that, that thought of like, you know, always appeasing, always pleasing, always... You know, a lot of times we live our lives because, you know, we want to make other people happy mo um, most of the circumstances that we're yeah. in, situations that we're in. So I think you get to a certain age, hopefully, where you say, all right, stop. Why are you doing this? Are you doing this for you? Or yeah. Are you doing it for some sort of reciprocated, you know, attention is it would it so you have to yeah, really beautiful and and i'm i am working on that i think i'm getting a lot better i'm sort of like going hey you know not comparing myself to mm -hmm. others as much like i have a problem not a problem but i envy those people who i perceive as having their shit together i don't i like them but i'm sort of i look at them like god yeah. Why can't that be me? Yeah. Why? And I look at you like that because what? Yeah, I just feel like look at you. You've you've been married to the same person since what eighty nine. Mm -hmm. So that's what thirty. I think we have. 
I can't. I think it's thir- I don't know. Well, it's a while. It's coming up to thirty three or thirty four. And every time year. I've met you, you're just so like you're a straight shooter, but you're very. You almost seem like you're just in a constant state of uh, meditation. Oh, in a good way. That's so, that's, I will take that one. My dissertation is around, has that in it. I'm looking at refuge practice in myth and where we see these archetypal images of refuge in all myth, in all these different myths, how that's such a key piece, kind of what we were just talking about earlier, which is going to get cut from this conversation, (laughs) but the importance of kind of collecting oneself and settling and making sure we're going to the ocean or hiking the mountain or doing those things that rest the mind so that the other stuff can come through. And we can't get to it unless we do sort of settle back, search out those, or those places search us out. Sometimes we don't have to be like doing it. It comes to us, you know. But I feel like you, you've been like this for quite some time. There's a, I'm not saying you're perfect because you're going to tell me you're not. I'm a hundred percent. We can guarantee (laughs) <laughs> of course, of course. But you feel like you, I feel like you have a real grasp on things that are very important, things that I don't think I have a grasp on, which are um, career, family and love, uh, you know, uh, passions, just sort of purpose, purpose. I don't think anyone gets out of feeling same old shitty self as Pema Chodron, the Buddhist teacher says, that feeling of same old shitty self. Well, someone who was once talking to her, that like we have this, we do have self-denigration in built in, which I do too, for sure. I mean, that is something you, certainly writing a dissertation right now, the doubt just kind of sits on the shoulder. And then there are moments where there's so much trust, like it's okay. And then there is that discursive, like, so it's a battle this right. that we all have. We're always battling with ourselves. I mean, from the Buddhist point of view, you know, pardon the expression, I'm not a professional Buddhist, but I do study it and it's in my dissertation. It's about becoming friends with or like becoming intimate with the thing that's just, you just want as far away as possible from yourself. Like there's no way I'm accepting that part of myself. And like the Buddhist view would be not a problem. Let Like if you open to it and you take a seat right in it, it actually shifts and changes and never stays as that one concrete, jealous person, raging person, right. small minded, you know, mm-hmm. it's always moving through or. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the Buddhist. No, thing. no, it's good. It's uh, hmm. huh, just, it's just making me think right now. You're making me think. What are you thinking about, Michael? No, I, I'm not going to get into <laughs> it, but it's, it's just like, uh, you know, sometimes my mind goes a certain place when I hear something that's impactful or why i say certain things or why i do certain things or act certain ways and then hearing you i i guess subconsciously it responds or makes me think of things that i do that i'm like huh i don't know if that's healthy or i don't know if that i should be doing that or maybe you know i should be more positive in certain things i tend to go down sort of a negative place a lot now it's not a negative place i'm fun to be around ryan yeah. when you say I think he's fun piece. to be yeah. around. <laughs> it's, 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 it's not like I'm I'm a, I'm a drag, but I definitely, you know, feel like I can go down that place where it's like, ah, this person, this and that, 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 blah, 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 instead of just sort of like not spending so much time in that area because it's unhealthy. You know, not to be so Jewish with you, but because I'm a born <laughs> Jewish person. Yes. There's this, have you heard this phrase about Lush and Hura? Have you ever heard that in the Jewish? I know Kuna Hura. Kuna her is like keep the keep so lush and her is away. like they in the orthodox jewish circles sometimes let's say someone's just had a difficult pregnancy a birth or something's happened to a family mm-hmm. lush and her the community might get together and practice just not gossiping saying things out loud that are negative as an offering for healing that person and lush and her to refrain from saying the thing out loud like it's a really good like we have a couple of good things in our tradition yeah (laughs) that's one of them yeah i mean that's yeah inside of you is brought to you by factor i i have told this story because it is a true story put me on a polygraph factor meals are like Uh, a godsend (laughs) they are incredible meals that get delivered to my house that are affordable 
I, I save so much money from not even going to the grocery store and getting food. And then you get food that's wasted and, or, or delivery services for food. You spend so much money and factor meals are not only saving me money, but they're delicious. They're delicious. And there's so many options. Um, they got sent to my house and I thought it was like someone was just giving me that as a birthday present because they arrived on my birthday and I, I made the chicken with mashed cauliflower, which tasted like mashed potatoes with broccolini. And I was just like, why am I not doing this every day? For me, it's all about the convenience. Really, if I can find anything that saves me time, I jump on it. When my wife sends me to the store to buy stuff for dinner, I'm an idiot. I walk around the aisles, I have no idea where anything's at. It ends up taking me like an hour. But with Factor Meals, it's all sent to me. I don't have to worry about wasting time. That's true. I love it. And not only that, but you can go, all right, honey, we're going to pick our week's meals. Mm -hmm. What are you in the mood for? How about this? How about this? Great. You know what you're going to get. You're excited to get it. Yep. Boom. No shopping. I, that is so true, man. Look, refresh your healthy habits without missing a beat. Choose from 34 plus weekly flavored packed dietitian approved meals ready to eat in two minutes. Level up with gourmet plus options prepared to perfection by chefs ready to eat in record time. Treat yourself to upscale meals with premium ingredients like broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus. Head to factormeals.com slash inside50 and use code inside50 to get 50% off. Need an extra boost to help support your wellness goals and feel your best for the rest of your summer? Try Protein Plus Meals with 30 grams of protein or more per serving. Round out your meal and replenish your snack supply with an assortment of 45 plus add-ons, including breakfast items like our delicious apple cinnamon pancakes, bacon and cheddar egg bites, bacon, potato, and egg breakfast skillet. Or for an easy wellness boost, try refreshing beverage options like cold-pressed juices, shakes, and smoothies. I order the cold-pressed juices. I order five for the week. It is awesome. This is something I'm going to continue and I think you should give this a try. This August, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh flavor-packed meals delivered to your door. Ready in just two minutes, no prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash inside50 and use code inside50 to get 50% off. That's code inside50 at factormeals.com slash inside50 to get 50% off. Because sometimes just giving voice to it constantly can be the bummer. Like saying out loud to the person what we don't like about things or always, that can be the thing that concretizes it or makes it worse. Or So you're practicing refraining, then yeah. you're like, all right, we're just going to take a pass on that. Yeah. Taking a knock out of somebody, taking a bite out of somebody, doing a... Yeah. Yeah, it has a good... Source I, I, material. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I think, yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to. You're going to be negative. <laughs> no, it wasn't a negative thing. It was just, I feel Come like. Come on, let's argue. This is no, Jewish I, of us. No, I, I just, it's not arguing. I believe what you're saying. Um, I, I just like, I never talk politics on the show, but I think that it's just like, mm. I feel like it's unfortunate that, you know, in the last X amount of years or whatever, that mm. we can't have an open forum about things. In fact, it's probably been there for longer than just a few years. I mean, it's been, yeah. it's sort of like, you know. Um, what do you make of that? I mean, isn't it crazy? I we just, can't I just even really it. be in the same room. But there are my husband, my best friend, I have really good friends. They are, there is not two sides. There is what is right and what is wrong. And I have people on the other side that feel the same way too. I mean, it is like cuckoo bird. <laughs> it, well, it's just like, can I even have any conversations? And every time you think of saying something, you're like, um, I should. It's that's what upsets me is that I'm stopping myself from saying eighty percent of but what I, I, I was thinking. But I think right now, this is just my two cent opinion. It will pass. It'll. I think we could do with a little, sure. like, let's find the common ground and not just do the dump or do the... Yeah. And yet, at the same time, we're in this moment, movement with Black Lives Matters and Me Too, where mm -hmm. to be able to call out things when you see it, say it when you, you know, that's really important too. So I guess we're all... It is. And I can speak to you as like a soul sister, as being white and being raised with incredible privilege We've been in such a soup 
But we, it's sort of like such a learning curve to even mm -hmm. take in these other ideas, take them into heart and then know how to proceed. Like I, I don't know anyone that's getting it right. I'll just say this. I don't think it was fair for so many years for black people, Hispanics, people of color to be typecast or stereotyped and cast always as this and this and this for so long and not be given the opportunities that privileged white people have had. And I hate that, you know, old Hollywood that we used to play, you know, an Asian character when we weren't Asian. And right. there was a lot of terrible, horrible things. So I don't mind at all i'm like i step back and go hey you guys deserve everything <laughs> like you you deserve to be respected and paid attention to so that's not i don't I, that's i don't have any issues with that no. at all i think my issues are more with just like um you say something and it's you don't mean to be mean or you don't mean to be ignorant or you don't mean and you're lambasted by certain things right. and there's just not an educational sort of like i think because as as, as a child i was sort of um no one had patience with me. I was sort of ADD all over the place. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't, you know, I didn't get affection or love at home. So, you know, when I get like somebody yells at me or tells me, you know, I don't like that. Yeah. I don't like to be told you're dumb, you're stupid, you can't. Oof. It's it's a bigger thing. So I guess it just used to be sort of an open forum where you kind of didn't worry about what you said too much. And now you have to be, and it's good to be, empathetic i think it's good to be i mean the way rob my husband talks about it is like it's sort of our turn a little bit just to be more listening like mm -hmm. he it and that's not an easy thing to develop right. if we're used to being able to just say how we feel or i don't like that or you know have like it's okay to just listen for a little while yes like, just to sort of balance it and that doesn't come easy no it doesn't, yeah. but I think that's the most important thing there is, is listening. Right. Whether, I mean, in, in life, that's the number one thing. Listen, Yeah. learn, understand. I mean, in, in acting 101, the number one thing they teach you is listen. Right. Any kind of improv, listen. Right. Uh, look, you have had an awesome career and you've done so many things and you've worked with so many great people. I know you went to performing arts high school. Right. I know you did all these things. Were your parents behind that? Because they weren't, you didn't have actors in your family. No, my parents were divorced. My dad was an executive in public television down in DC. My mom was up in New York City. Um, but she really came out of that whole uh women's movement when Betty Friedan wrote The Feminine Mystique and women burned their bras and were like, I am not staying in a marriage where I don't, you know. <laughs> right. She was kind of part of that. And when I lived in Great Neck, Long Island, I was surrounded in that soup before we moved to Manhattan of women of divorced. Uh, Great Neck was, yeah, really unusual enclave of single women with daughters, really bright, brilliant women kind of finding their way through that period. So my mom's thing more was almost so much of you can do anything you want. Yeah. Was it hard? Um, what, when did your father? I was eight. Yeah, I'm, divorce is difficult. hard. It was. I don't did know anyone. Did you feel like abandonment issues even like? Um. Did you ever notice that? You know, it's funny because I'm such, I'm a mythologist now. I, I have certain images that come to mind. Like my brother and I were very young. I'm younger. My brother's two and a half years older. But from the time we were really little, eight, nine years old, we were taking the subway and then the train, sometimes the bus from New York to DC to visit my dad on the weekends without any parental help. That's four hours, isn't it? Four and a half hours. So I have like a Hansel and Gretel thing, like brother yeah. and me, like in Penn Station or in, yeah, that kind of thing. But sure, that stuff, it's a lifetime of working through of, yeah, I don't know. And, you know, I'm thinking, I don't know if you have this, but contemporary friends, I'm sure you have friends that have gone through divorce and oh, seeing yeah. now from the parental point of view, just the heartbreak of nobody wants to go through that. Nobody wants to put their kids through that they would never choose to cause that kind of so it's funny that it's almost like a facet of a diamond the different yeah are your parents still with you my dad passed away from covid 
Are you serious? Yeah, that was pretty no, awful. No, how old? He was 86, almost 87. But he was in perfect health before that? Not perfect health. I mean, 87, you're going to have things. Was he 86 or 87? Let's say 86. April of 2020. So it was right when it was all hitting. And yeah, yeah. My mom's still here. She's still living in the same apartment on 86th Street in York Avenue. And wow. she's this very, uh, she's a political activist for nuclear disarmament yeah. and writes on it and travels, That's used to travel quite a lot and speak on, speak on peace well shout about peace <laughs> as activists tend to do <laughs> wow yeah absolutely i mean during COVID, when your father passed were you even allowed to go to a funeral nothing we had nothing did you ever get to celebrate his life or do anything last summer not this past summer the summer before we all went to maine where we would meet right over the years uh and my very close step family just the per, just the immediate family we had a little memorial up on the island that was nice. But the day he died, I mean, you hear, it's so interesting hearing when people die, like what happens when they, so my brother figured out, because it was COVID, how to get an iPad in the hospital room filming him. So it was, this is the day he passes away. It was me and my brother on Zoom with him and my stepmother, and we're just chit-chatting. I mean, just tells you like when the body is ready to go. And we're talking about being at Ma in Maine, and I hold up Trader Joe's mango slices. And I'm just saying on the Zoom call with my dad in one frame and my brother and my stepmom, I'm like, I don't know. These Trader Joe mango slices are getting me through COVID. I don't know what it is. They're just so delicious and chit-chatting. And then we started talking about being in, on the island on Buston's Maine and chit-chat, chit-chat. And I look at my father's frame and I'm like, I don't think dad's breathing. And because it was COVID, we had to call, my brother had to call the hospital to get a nurse to go into the room to see if he had passed away. So it took like 15, 20 minutes till the nurse comes in. Then she couldn't tell us because you have to have a doctor. She says, can you please just hold a minute? She goes to get the doctor, then the doctor comes in. I mean, it was wild. But the point being what? that, um, I know. I mean, why wouldn't, he, if you stop breathing, doesn't shouldn't there be like beep, 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 something? No. But that's a good point. No one brought that up. But more what I think the bigger question is, is that kind of relaxed feeling, chit-chatting about Maine, talking about mango Being slices. He knew like the, the closest people and, in his, and then I felt like he just thought I can go. <sighs> yeah. I was, I mean, yeah, I'm talking about the positive, but believe, there was a lot of heartbreak. You were pretty break. emotional. Oh, at one point my... Rob just like scraped me off the floor and like took me. This is like the week. Oh, when he first went in because of COVID, drove me up to Malibu and we brought beach chairs and sat along the. Because you're just you're not in your right mind. You couldn't no. get on a plane, and I didn't get on a plane. So it's, yeah. yeah, you know it's it, what's crazy is I was incredibly close with my grandfather Irv. Irv was my I mean he was my joy, and my grandmother who's still still with us. And he had Alzheimer's, so I slowly watched him deteriorate. Yeah. So I was losing a piece of him. As yes, time kept my going dad on. had some dementia too, and I was losing him before COVID. That's such a hard one, isn't it? It's just it's such so a hard. hard one. And I felt like I, I still, <clears throat> I still to this day think I haven't really mourned him, mm -hmm. and um, I think about him all the time. And sometimes I think about, gosh, he was so important to your life in your life. I mean, you, I, 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 to, I talked about him endlessly to my friends, to people, to everybody knew how much he I loved. raised you, or just no, as a... but like he was just a great role model, and he was always there for me. And like, uh, you know, I'd stay months with them during the summer, and he, t you know, when I learned my bar mitzvah, I, I learned it phonetically, like they wrote it out phonetically, the and, I, and I memorized the whole thing, and he would help me run it, and like. He was just, I can go on about him forever. I would make endless videos. I interviewed him constantly. Like, wow. I just, I, I don't know. I just, I, I, yeah, crazy about him. And even to this day, I think, why, why are you not just more, why aren't you more upset? Why aren't you, 
what is it that you have you not let go but you have like i don't when did he pass away uh, a couple of years ago oh so it's new during the time of covid or before covid it was before COVID, right before COVID, which I think he decided somehow subconsciously. To, <laughs> but no, I I don't know what it is, but maybe it was because it was years of losing him where the last year or so it wasn't even him. Yeah. It was like, hey, Mike, where are we going? But you know what's weird is I wouldn't see him for some months. Yeah. And then I'd come back to Florida and visit. And I was with my dad and my grandmother, and he didn't remember anybody's name at this point. Mm. And I walked into the place where he was. He was staying at this nice place they had for him with other people with, you know, mental, yeah, whatever memory care, memory or care. Like that. And he was. I walked in. And he's on this chair and he's sleeping. And I just go, Irv! <laughs> I just yelled at him. And he, I'm telling you, I don't know what it was, <laughs> but he didn't miss a beat. He just goes. Mike, <laughs> and I'm telling you, my eyes welled up, and my yeah, grandmother I have goosebumps looked. My as grandmother you're just looked shocked, like, yeah. He just hears my voice and pops up, and it was, yeah. I mean, look, death is not for the faint of heart, and growing old is not for the faint of heart. No. And um, this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp has been with me for a long time, and I think I know why because this uh, this podcast deals with a lot of mental health, um, people talking about their anxiety and depressions, and uh, we're all imperfect. We're all flawed, and that's the beautiful thing about life. And sometimes we get in ruts. Sometimes um, our path isn't as clear that's in front of us. We're not sure what we're going to do. We can't find purpose. This is where better help comes in. And it's so important, whether you're dealing with decisions around your career, your relationships, or anything else, therapy helps you stay connected to what you really want while you navigate life so you can move forward with confidence and excitement. Trusting yourself to make decisions that align with your values is like anything. The more you practice it, the easier it gets. The great thing about this is the stigma is going away, folks. So, you know, my dad, he doesn't go to therapy. And, you know, I've been talking to him. And I'm like, listen, everybody so many people do this. You're not the only person who gets in ruts. You know, when he, we lost my sister, um, I finally got him into therapy. And um, it's just important to know you're not alone. You're just not alone. And with better help, you can get your uh, therapist online. If you don't like your therapist, you change it like that. It's so easy. It's so much more affordable than looking up some therapist that you don't know and going, uh, yeah, and it costs you so much money to go in there. Look, if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire. It's so, so quick. Uh, and get matched with a licensed therapist. Switch therapist anytime for no additional charge, period. It's entirely online. So it's convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire. It takes seconds and get matched with a licensed therapist. Switch therapist anytime for no additional charge. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash inside today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash inside. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash inside today to get 10% off your first month. That's 10% off your first month. BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash inside. This message is sponsored by Discover. Did you know you could reduce the number of unwanted calls and emails with online privacy protection? The latest innovation from Discover. Discover will help regularly remove your personal info, like your name and address, from 10 popular people search websites that could sell your data and they'll do it for free. Activate in the Discover app. See terms and learn more at discover.com slash online privacy protection. You know, that sucks that you had to deal with it. You know, I, I mean, look, there's always good qualities. Like I say to my grandmother, I mean, look how many years you were married. Look how many years you had him. She goes, I know, I'm grateful. Yeah. But that doesn't, you know, it's still, it's still not, you, you want him around forever, but that just doesn't happen. People, everyone dies. I try to think about that. We all are going to die. We do, Michael. It this just is true. happens. <laughs> and it's hard. It's like hard to think about that stuff. But um, 
anyway, so your parents... I want to offer you something. Like when you're saying, like, I don't know if I haven't grieved him or I haven't something. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he had favorite things to do or anything like that. But let's say, like, what's one thing you just would say, like, this is him. This was him. Like, he loved a black cherry soda from... You know what I do? I, I did not even notice this. But since he's passed... I, I, I'm just real, have this, having this realization. Now. Okay. <laughs> this is crazy. The two things that he loved more than, I mean, he loved his family more than anything that was it, were tennis and golf. Perfect. And I've been playing them since he passed every day, every so week. So beautiful. So one thing you he might just want to add for fun, like even if it's woo-woo, you can say, Helen Slater, this is so dumb woo-woo, but okay. When you go to tee off or go to do your... Just say like, I dedicate this to you, or this is to you, for you. This is my offering, wherever you are, because God knows what you gave me it was just like the gift. And you just kind of make it like, yeah. that's like a way to I think to that's keep awesome. It. I'm going to do that. You know, I just remember- Don't forget the dumb woo-woo Helen Slater, so dumb. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he was just so, you know, we all have that person in our lives, we hope, that just, you know, he'd take me golfing and- he was just like, I just love being around this guy. He was so funny. Yeah. He would be like, oh, Jesus, what the hell are you doing, you shithead, to himself. <laughs> and he would get so hard. Oh, he'd say that to oh, himself? Oh, yeah, to himself. Oh. And then he'd go, he was like, oh, that's a good hit, Mike. That's I don't know how you do that. That's You got natural ability. Like, he would just make you feel good. He was so always beautiful. such a good grandfather. Oh, he'd send me letters and pictures. Do you he'd know, save I things. have to tell you one of the best things, my dad's long time, um, she was his secretary, executive assistant. She told me after my dad died, gave me this great thing of like, you can still talk to him. And I've had, because I hike every morning, I've had times on that mountain where I'm just talk to my dad. He was so good at like investments and that kind of, and sometimes I'm like, dad what do I do? <laughs> like, how do I, but it's in a way, it's fun. You weirdly summon them, like to just say, yeah. even like what you're saying when you're feeling that thing of just like, man, I just feel so shitty. Like, you know, Irv. Keep that spirit alive. You can say to him, Irv, like, what the heck? Like, what's the next thing? You know, I swear to God, I do this too. <laughs> I, I do that with him. I'll That's go, good. And I hear his voice going, you know, he'll say things like, about death, I remember having this conversation. He was like old and he's like, I remember, I don't know how it started, but we're in the car and he goes, I don't look, Mike, this is, this is what happens. We, we die. And it was, it was very basic, but he says, he says, look, I have lived a great life. I got to experience my grandson. Beautiful. I got to have, you know, this family, family is, the, the best thing you can have. Mm-hmm. And he says, but this is just the way it goes. And you have to accept it. You have to. The way he was he was saying it to me like I was a really little, like a little child. But I needed to hear it like that. Yeah. And. Um, like not a problem. And, We're and, here I, and I do we'll hear die. his voice. It resonates with me at certain moments in my life where I hear him say, what are you going to do? This is. Yeah. This is it. Yeah. All right, get kicked in the ass, you know, but whatever. All right, but back to you. All right, so, uh, all right, so you're acting and, you know, what, so what was it like when you first started getting involved in like, you know, you know, acting, I guess, for your parents who weren't doing something like that and they were like, your mom was an activist. Like, what what did they, how did they feel about that? They were super supportive, Mm. really supportive. And I had that dumb luck of working right away. And we weren't allowed to work in high school, but we did, you know, Erica Gimple was in my class and Keisha Lewis and Lisa Vidal. They, we all have worked, Catherine DeProom since being in school. Um, but we would do little things like commercials. Erica played Coco in the TV series Fame. And wow. so we that was a big exception. Um, but we had a taste of what it was to audition, even though we were in high school. And so it wasn't like, it, the pump was getting primed by the time right. I said to my parents, I want to take a year off before going to college and just see if I can get work. Yeah. When did you... Were they ever like, you know, it's it's that thing where your parents really, truly don't believe that you're going to become a famous actress. I don't know how they would. It's such a hard, difficult, like, it's it's like 
you won the lottery. I will ways. say this though, my mo- my dad, a hundred percent, yes. My mom, like one of her shining qualities, is just this crazy enthusiasm hmm. for what you love. Like she just has that. She's also rough. We've had a head bumping for many years. I'm sure. She's very volatile personality, but in that lane of just like, do it. Why not? Wow. Why not you? She really had that enthusiasm. And That's nice love. because, um, you know, I think it it finally happened for you know my parents. It took a long time. It was like, wait, you're doing independent movie. That's that's not a real movie, is it? Not, yeah, it's not in theaters. No, it's not. Well, then it's not real. Who's in it? Well, there's no big actors in it. Well, how can it be a movie? What did your parents do? What do they do? My dad worked for a pharmaceutical company, and my mother, although she did repertory theater when she was younger, she and she always wanted to be famous and an actress. But she interviewed, you know, people like in a small town, and you know, people um, involved with sports, professionals, and things like that. And um, you know, she always wanted to have the attention. Um, But I, I don't think that they ever really thought that that I would amount to anything. I don't think, in fact, nobody did, really. And and this is <laughs> this goes back to my grandfather and my grandmother. I, I saw like my my uh, grandfather's book, his old, uh, what do you call it, a uh, diary, <laughs> and big word. And he um, <laughs> he said something like, uh, I was like, and I, and I can't believe it. I read it to you, Ryan, remember? Yeah. It was like, I can't believe, you know, my, my grandson, Michael, went on to you know, be an actor and, you know, uh, doing this show and uh it was just like I, the doubt you could <laughs> sense the doubt but i understand that it's not like any, everybody's going to be like yes you're the most unpopular kid in the school and the smallest kid in the school and you're from this small town and you're going to be famous there's nothing you, there's just, it just like doesn't make sense and a no. lot of people think they're going to do that and they don't and i i was fortunate enough to you know get out of there and and do something yeah. but um but to have the support and have the love that you had to go do that, certainly, I could tell you from experience, helps a lot. That is something that, you know, I think profoundly helps your confidence and your sort of not giving up hope and sort of like, I'm doing the right thing. Yeah, you know? that was lucky for that. That part was nice it was not the that wasn't the hurdle those weren't that wasn't their support was not what the, was the hurdle you know i think for women mothers and daughters just mythically for a daughter to individuate and separate from the mother it's gonna incur lots of challenges it just is i'm not a mini her my daughter's not a mini me and when you see that, that it really is like, oh, that is a separate, really separate being. We have different, inter- we're just different kind of, it's going to cause. Friction? I think so. I mean, my mom's always been on this enlightenment path, doing the S training and doing Course in Miracles along with her brilliant brain. But that can't replace the actual what happens in a, in the dynamic between two people? People unfold at different paces. You can't make somebody go at your pace. And that ability to really do that deep listening and respect that, you know, yeah, I think it's a very, very challenging, super I, hard. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So there was some friction that you couldn't really just explain. Mother, yeah. Just because you weren't alike and maybe she wanted you to kind of sort of inadvertently follow in her steps you know, in a she, way. It'd be interesting if someone does a study or dissertation on this, but those women of my mother's generation that were like, hey, we we are liberated. You can do whatever you want. You are free. And then the daughters of that generation going like, I'm not I'm not quite so sure what freedom means to me cuz I've only been raised in a soup of you can do anything. There's no they had to push against immigrant parents and or that kind of mm-hmm. Betty Friedan the sort of what marriage is, that kind of the conditioning of being raised in the 50s and then having us in the 60s like how we so our individuating from that was and it was unusual. We had to find it on our own terms, what our separation was going to look like, because it certainly wasn't going to be, we're going to be free, because all they were saying is, go be free, go be, you know. Huh. Yeah. So what I gather from that is, 
And maybe this, I missed the point completely. No. But I'm thinking that your mother faced so much adversity and so many hardships. And now she's like, and you're free. And there's, there, it's twofold. It's like one, you know, where's your struggle, young lady, without saying it. And B, you're like, I don't have to struggle as much as you did. And I don't I, and think she, I think it was more like, we did the hard work. Go, go fly, <laughs> go be free. But it tur it turns out that psychologically, from a Jungian point of view or depth psychological mm -hmm. point of view, nobody gets out of these uh, initiations, these threshold moments, the challenges, yeah. the things that set us back, that move us. You know, I got gotcha. you. That was kind of the sham of the '70s self actualization movement. You're going to awaken in a in a weekend and then you're done. <laughs> yeah. You <laughs> like, trip a little bit. <laughs> you know, and that's just your <laughs> and then, belief uh, and you have jargon to replace actual depth work, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, I can't believe you were Moving 18 when you did Supergirl. Yeah. You were 18 years old. Yeah. I turned 19 when I was filming. And Juno Schwartz directed that? Yes. Who directed sure. a lot of Smallville episodes? He did many. I oh, love Janelle. Oh yeah, we love him. Michael, Michael, why they, please, please be quiet. Please, I have to get through the day. <laughs> this little French guy who was he was great. He was a great director. He still directs. Yeah, he's like in his eighties. It's great. I think, and he's still going. Do you remember um, the feeling you got when you got this larger than life? I mean, this is at the time a thirty-five million dollar movie. The budget. I mean, a lot of big people are in this movie. They have a clip because they were filming when they told me that I got the part. I was at Pinewood Studios. There's a clip of you reacting? There's a documentary on the making of Supergirl and you see me walking into the room with the Salkins and Timothy Burrell and the cameras on and they're like, you know, thank you for coming and bup, 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 and you got the part, you know. So Did you your see eyes it. light up? Oh, I start crying. Like I just, I, you know, my whole life changed. Your whole life changed. Like massive, massively changed. How many times did you test for this? I went in, Lynn Stallmaster was casting. I don't know if it was once or twice. And then the screen test was the big thing where they flew me to London. And I don't know who else or how many other people. That might be in the documentary, but I just haven't seen it in so many right. years. Were you intimidated? Um, Were you nervous around big stars like Faye Dunaway or Peter O'Toole or... My my singular <laughs> memory of just the I mean so many years ago it's so it's forty years ago is it forty one years ago yeah um they really did it very smartly if I'm speaking correctly so Alf joined who trained Chris Reeve trained me so when I flew to London I was by myself I had no chaperone or anything like that but I trained for four months just gaining. 15, 20 pounds, weight training, trampolining, wow. horseback riding, fencing, every possible swimming three times a week. I was in such a rig of running in, at the back lot of Pinewood Studios. And I met one of my dear friends who was my stunt double, Tracy Eden, now Tracy Michaels. So my point is it really grew. You know, I was in London in this cocoon. So by the time it came to meeting Peter O'Toole or meeting Faye Dunaway or... I was in such a, I felt like I was the moss that was attached to the whole thing. Like it was intimidating and- But you were prepared. So prepared. Like it wasn't just coming like now, you know what it's like. You get a part and you have like three days or something and you're just trying to get those six pages of dialogue memorized. Yeah. It's so not a way to I mean, work. Look, I mean, I, I don't want to get in. I'm sure people have asked you, but the one thing I think of, I don't think you even know this, Ryan. And you could just say, plead the fifth, move on. Plead the fifth. Mm -hmm. But like, I always hear horror stories about Faye Dunaway. And I just want to know if any of it's true. Or did you ever see that? Or let's just say, was she just intense or something you could remember? Or maybe everything was great. You know, I did not have many scenes with her. So for me, um, what I the thing I remember was now that I'm going to be 60 years old this year. Wow, you look great. And so she was probably, thank you. you she do. was probably only 45, maybe. Uh, I don't know. We can look it up. But how concerned she was with the lighting and the perfectionism of an aging woman. 
and being really struck by that more than anything else, more than is she difficult or that was the thing like really tampering with the lights, making sure it was, um, you know, being self-protective, being, I never have had that. Like I've been on TV shows forever and there are actresses, they just are making, I, it's sort of like, I hope, so <laughs> I hope like, you guys have it. In other words, you're saying, <laughs> they the take the care day, of themselves. trust the DP. Trust but everybody. in a way, I've seen things I've been in. My one mm-hmm. of my closest friends, Helen Hunt. We have a very funny story. Helen I, Hunt's one of your closest friends. We she I introduced me Hunt. to my husband. What? Yeah, I love that Helen many. Hunt. Do you know what I always <laughs> think about when I think of Helen Hunt? Her amazing moment in Castaway when she hears that he's alive and she collapses in the kitchen. Oh, that just dropped me. That she's reaction. Such an incredible. Anyway, actress. I love her. Go ahead. I was doing a series in Austin and we're hiking when I got back and I was like, I I look so awful. Like I saw it, I was like, oh hell, Bill, I just look so terrible. I mean, I saw the thing, I just can't believe how, and she go, and I'm, I'm like, why do I look so awful? She said, because we're dying. And I was like, well, if we're dying, I guess I look pretty fantastic. And it really popped it for me. From that moment on, I was like, yeah, we're aging, I'm dying, it looks like that. I'm I'm done. Oh my God! Right? That is exceptional advice. Right? <laughs> Think about it. I'm gonna use that forever. Well, she's the funniest person on earth. And when you get in fights with Rob, you go, "You bitch! <laughs> what were you thinking?" No, no, I never, ever, ever, ever do that. <laughs> no, I, you think I would think you would do that? Um, but that makes a lot of sense. You talk about like getting older, and we all do. Like I, I even look to some degree. Um, you know, I don't look at him and say, Hey, how's the, I just kind of just let it, everything go. And then it is what it is. Yeah. But I definitely look at myself sometimes and I'm just like, wow, wow. You just, you're just not the kid you sometimes feel like, or you remember, and you're looking yeah. more and more like an older person. And this is just the way it goes. This yeah. is again, this is, this is life. It can't, we can't stop it's it. Irv. We need Irv, Irv. in the room. <laughs> um, but you know, I, but I could sort of understand too. It's much harder for a woman. It's much harder they though. Like your whole life when you, especially when you're an actress, not especially when you're an actress, but when you're an actress, it's like, you know, um, Look, there's I, a premium on how you look. There's a premium on pretty. There's a premium on, you know, they're just, we just value that so much in mm-hmm. our culture. And we don't have as many avenues for the elder women or aging or, you know, but they're, you know, it's all right. I go through this with like, I'm like, I see all these guys my age and they're all ripped. A lot of them doing probably, you know, testosterone, HGH, which is fine. Do whatever you want to do. I don't wow. give a shit. You know, I might even start it. But uh, <laughs> the point is, I look at him and I'm like, oh, my gosh. Man, do I need to look like that? I'm like, why do you need to look like that? Are you doing a superhero movie? Yeah. What do you need to do? <laughs> I don't want to work out that much. I don't want to hurt my body. I've already had surgeries. I don't feel like doing it. Don't you, you know what I mean? It's like, I don't want to do this shit. I'll play some sports. I'll have some fun. I'll try to be as healthy as I can. But, like, I don't want to, like constantly just be ripped and shredded and drinking these beans and leaves and and it just it's so daunting and it's so it's so hard to do that and the overall um result could be fascinating and you're but then you have to maintain it yes. it's like shouldn't the part of me is like shouldn't a 50 year old kind of look like a 50 year old like they used to when you used to watch movies like George C. Scott's 58. He looks like he's 80. What the yeah. fuck happened to him? <laughs> it's true. We've had a weird, <laughs> you know, difference. So everybody's trying to be looking as young as they can. And well, cigarettes and alcohol will do that. Mm hmm. That's true. That's true. Uh, secret of my success. Um, one of my heroes, one of everyone's heroes. You got to work with the Michael J. Fox. He got to work with you. But um, I can't imagine that. that I mean, was, was that a, just awesome? Total fun job. Show up in New York City where I was from and be, easy to work with. Oh my gosh. Dream. Like total You were so young here too. Oh yeah. This is all like I don't know. I was He's older than you, right? A few years. Not that much. He looked like an infant in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> if you look back, he looks like He's so young looking. Well, he was on that TV show Family, Family Ties, Ties, right? I Forever? loved Family Ties. You guys did you ever watch that? 
I didn't, but um, that's, I I've seen a little bit of it. we've been together for a million years. Is that the theme song? And I bet we'll be together for a million more. Yeah, I knew all of it. My brother and I used to <laughs> sing. I used to love Family Ties. But go ahead. Working with that's him. Just, it. You just love working fun, with him. Yeah. I remember watching the moment where he's watching you drink water from the water fountain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's just the most sexual kid's uh, dream right, fantasy. Right. And you just look over at him. And I'm like, oh, my God. This with is the 1980s weird. haircut with and the, the blue eyeliner, lots of blue. Yeah. Yeah. It felt very 80s. I mean, you did a lot of memorable movies like Ruthless People and working with Bette Midler. And I remember the scene with... The you're talking to Danny DeVito, Jen Dreinheld on the phone, and the with the hamburger, and it's and it sounds like you're getting tortured or whatever. Right. And you know you're screaming. It, it looks like it was so much fun on that one too. That was that was. Those were the Zucker brothers and uh, uh, Jim Abrams. Who then the Zucker so brothers do um, Kentucky Fried Movie and Top, Airplane and Airplane oh. and Top Secret. Were they great to work with? So much fun. All you did was laugh and improvise. You know, I don't know that we improvised much back then. That's like much more now current. Right, the thing to do. Everybody's improvising. Yeah. Ruthless People was based on an O. Henry short story called like Ransom. Oh, I can't remember what it is. But anyway, the writing was so tight because it's O. Henry. But that's why I think that movie works so well. Wow. Did you only work with great people? Have you, for the most part, have you ever worked with those guys, that, guys or oh, gals? Oh, gosh, that, yeah. I mean, I've been around. Before? Oh, yeah. I've been around a really long time. You have, you're not that <laughs> old. And don't say that. You're not that much older than me. But I mean, I've been working since, I mean, in high school, I did a thing with Amy and the Angel that Matthew Modine and Meg Ryan were in when I was 17 years old. So it's been that an ABC after school special. Do you remember what those were? Oh that my ring God, about? come on, yeah. So Amy and the Angel, I played Amy and I was the, su it was a remake of It's a Wonderful Life. I was a suicidal teenager and Meg played one of the girls that was, I can't remember what her part, one of the high school girls and Matthew Modine played like the angel. I mean, crazy. We've been around a long time. Wow, but you've seen some shit. You've seen some actors lose their shit. You've seen some people that are difficult to work with. And how do you deal with that? You know, I've had a couple of experiences in the last 10 years, and I won't name any names because I don't want to do that. But the mm -hmm. hardest thing I would say in the television world are when actors show up and don't have their lines down, like at all. And I feel, and I understand the family pressures and the stresses, but I really think the stress it's so hard to make these things the crew people working you know one hour television there's just nothing more brutal nothing 15 hour days like and then the crew on top and that thing of just you know if i could have a magic wand it would be we all would have better memories or be able to memorize lines better because i think that really does so you remember an incident or incidents where you know, someone didn't know their lines at all and it was holding everybody up and they, they didn't care i mean i just it's it's maybe a way of working. I would say it's something that ages me or shows that I'm from a different thing where Pre some people just could get the lines just like that. I mean, one thing I really don't want to keep working for is because it is so hard to memorize now. I mean, as I'm getting older, it's just... It's a lot. Yeah, and my, my focus is so much on writing the dissertation and being mm -hmm, in school, and sure. then you're just kind of mowed into this interior world of acting and line memory. What do you remember about being on Smallville? That was so fun. You do, now she had fun. <laughs> that was great fun. Everybody knew their lines on that. Am I talking to you? Are you someone that never knew their lines? Is that no, why you're no, I at? Always, no, in fact, that's <laughs> one of my biggest pet peeves is when people don't know their lines and I always have to know them inside out. So a lot of times if they say, you know, what I don't like is the night before they say, hey, first up, you're gonna do this scene and we just rewrote it. That's That, that couldn't terrible, be more terrifying right? because I'm just, it as takes, stressed as you can be. Yeah. I want to, that's why I'd rather do a movie yeah. or rather do a series where you're about to shoot that they have it all written yeah. and you can prepare and yeah. know your stuff. It just and makes such a difference. About, it makes such a You change difference. lines up, it's it's not a good thing. But no. um, Smallville, you did a couple episodes, three episodes. I did three, was it three? Or something. Yeah. I had a great time. What do you remember? We didn't work together. 
I don't think so. No. I mean, we did kind of an iconic scene of putting the baby, Julian Sands and I putting the baby into the rocket to like go bring, bring it down to, and mm-hmm. then with, yeah, everyone was so kind on your set. Do you remember that? I loved them all. It was a family. It, it was it, just it sure like, was really a family. was There just... wasn't anybody I didn't like working with. No, and they were so sweet to me and very, you That's know, what I it's felt about. very welcome. That's what it's about. If the hardest thing I, and I, I'm repeating myself, is to be a guest star. And yeah. when you come into a, a, a place where everybody has it down, yeah. all their jobs, it's, yeah. they, they know what they're doing and you come in and you're the lone yeah. wolf or you're like the, you know, the, it's the hardest it's, one. You know what my friend part. Kathleen Wilhoit says? She says, being a guest star or a guest director is like being the girlfriend at your boyfriend's family Thanksgiving. <laughs> okay <laughs> it's I, like you're yeah. going you're kind of welcome there it's not your family it's not you. your thing you're they're kind still of testing like, you but you don't you do feel we that. like her yeah yeah <laughs> is he gonna marry and her? who did you work with uh, mostly tom and tom and i had a Kristen, little bit with laura vander L- laura v- vandervoort supergirl vandervoort she was supergirl yeah yeah and but it was Tom and Julian. It was Tom, though, in that third, second or third. I can't remember. It's too long ago. It hasn't been that long ago, has it? I think so. Like 10 years ago, 15 years ago. I should remember was that. Was it that long? What year? Yeah, it was something like that. What year was that, Ryan? What? Where she was on Smallville. Okay. Because you know we're doing the, I, I told you we're doing the Smallville Rewatch podcast. I know, that Talkville. sounds very So fun. everybody listening is going to be like, you have to have her on. Oh, You have to sure. come on. But we <laughs> might, what we might do is when we get there to your part. Call me up and just zoom me in. If you want to just blit, you know, breeze through it, yeah. uh, this episode, and then you can talk about what you remember and go, oh my God, I noticed this. It'd yeah. probably be fun. Yeah. It's kind of a-, a Why you know, not? Season seven and 10, she's in three episodes. Seven and 10. Well, season seven was my last season. I left after the seventh season. That's why we didn't- So what year was season? Oh, that was uh, 2007 it aired, uh, November of 2007, and then yeah, November of Yeah, 15 years ago. Do you think- Wow. Yeah, that was. It was a while ago. Do you still, I know you're writing, I know you're getting your PhD, you're doing this dissertation, you've got all this stuff going on, and, yeah. and music, and writing, and six albums, and I'm all this. I'm exhausted hearing you talk. Can I just yes, take a nap right but now? But do you still <laughs> honestly want to act? Oh. Or does it have to be something that- I mean, that, how honest do we want to get? Honest, look. It's honest Abe time. Here's the reality. You know, you've done it. You've, you're almost 60, you said. Yes. Isn't that great? If I say it, it freaks me out a little. Uh, like, it really is like, woof. How about you're older than 50? I'm, old, you're I'm over 50. You're a little older than 50. I'm a woman of a certain age. <laughs> and you've done big movies, and you've done big TV, and you've you've written, and you've played music, and you have a great marriage. You have children. A daughter. A daughter. Hannah. And you have all this, you know, you've lived your life, and you still have many years to go. Yeah. But at this point, do you just say, I want to do what inspires me, what fulfills me, what makes me, I don't know, happy is kind of, a, but I guess makes me happy, but a sense of, um, do something that has a sense of uh, play, enjoyment. I mean, you know, because I am, I'm so steeped in myth and depth psychology that that's not a light question for me. That's probably like the most profound question you could ask me. Right. And what I would say is, if you have the good fortune to feel a vocation or a calling towards something, if something is pulling you and you get animated by something, you are very, very lucky. That's good fortune. And for others, and myself included, like the, the happiest time of my life ever has been being in graduate school. Like, Isn't that something? there's no question. That could be my biggest fear. I've had so much joy <laughs> acting, and certainly my marriage, Rob Watsky, he's such an incredible partner. He teaches improv, and he has this nonprofit, and we do these great shows that at you can look him up at Turbine Arts. Okay, he's going to be so mad. Turbine-arts.org. There's a dash. And if they want to take an improv class, they can go there. Monday. Oh, yeah. Mondays, guys. And he's incredible. He's an incredible teacher. But anyway, those have all been great joys being in relation to other people. But the thing of the, like, the soul work, what is your, that is like, that's the $64,000 question. And some people might end up just being 
being of service to others and living, you know, it's different for everybody. For me, it was about this this thing of of education and specifically learning about myth and James Hillman's writings, Jung's writings, you know, the just that's been the joy. So I don't know what it leads to after this, but yeah. That's, you know, um, I don't know. It'd well, be yeah. great if like you could have a mythologist, you know, I need to call my mythologist the way you might <laughs> yeah. call your shrink. <laughs> yeah. It'd be like, it's fascinating. what would the myth person say about this? You know, it's funny because even though you're talking about something which a lot of people probably don't know a ton about, you've studied this, spent endless hours learning and, and educating yourself and doing this. I think the under, the, the message of of anything we do really is is ultimately doing things for yourself doing things it's not doing things for yourself it's but not doing things just to please people not doing things just to like we talked about earlier but doing things that you feel whole that make you feel complete james hillman who is very present in my dissertation who's a post jungian and has written incredible books revisioning psychology is one of the big ones but he would say you move towards something if it animates your life exactly and if you're doing something for other people all the time you're going to feel there's a deficit that you're something's out of sync i i've said this before sometimes because we have lived so much as actors where we are pleasing or trying to get it right or hit the mark or say the line and that is so much about it can be so much about what someone else needs from us, what the time is, what the director needs, what the writers need. We got to get it in on time. But the the thing of, uh, I sometimes will do like, no one's looking. Just very pretend there's nobody around. Like, what is it that you would like right now? What would you like to do right now? Just very quietly yeah, on the shoulder. Like, yeah. what, and it'd be like, I think, I would like to do this for a little while and learning to like fan that fire of what would be of what would be helpful right now in this moment. I hope Brian doesn't have those moments and <laughs> while he's sitting here they just go, "You know what? Hey Rosenbaum, kiss my ass." Yeah. This <laughs> <laughs> will be like what I really need is to get out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um all right, this is called Shit Talking with Helen Slater. These are rapid fire answers and okay. questions. Uh, these are from my top tier patrons um, who get to ask questions. There's tons of goodies there. They support the show. They help keep the, share, the yes. show flow. I love you, patreon.com slash inside of you. Keep supporting the show. Here we go. Leanne says, how do you feel about being associated with such an iconic character, Supergirl? And have you ever felt any pressure to live up to the ideals that she represents? Leanne is her name. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Leanne. For that question, um, I think there's a shadow part to playing a role called Supergirl, and the shadow is that you're dealing with imperfection, not you know feeling like you're playing a part that's just such a lacking any kind of deficit. Weirdly, mm -hmm. so that part I think is tricky, but ultimately I'm very grateful I got to do the part. Good, little Lisa. Did you take any props or wardrobe from the Supergirl set? Little Lisa? Mm -hmm. Well, Little Lisa and Big Lisa, I did not take any props or costumes Damn. from the set. <laughs> you know I would, and I have. Not, you have not. Well, not from your Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? That's from um, Onyx, that big mask up there in the middle. Wow. Uh, episode um, where I was too, uh, the real Lex was trapped in a basement. Wow. And the bad Lex, me, was also away from him, keeping him trapped, and I kept wow. that. I also kept a lot of other things. Wow. Kelly S., The Legend of Billy Jean is one of my favorite movies. You and Richard Bradford really got into character. Was it difficult filming the scenes with him when he was demoralizing and humiliating you? It was. He's such a great actor and so kind. And Legend of Billy Jean, the Comic Cons that I do, I would say almost more than half people are coming for that. They'll come up to me and say, I shaved my head because of Billy Jean. I, you know, that was, and Christian Slater was in it. We played brother and yeah. sister, and that had this kind of. So yeah, uh, that was very difficult. Sort of the very early, early embers of Me Too moment movement because Billie Jean kind of doesn't take it lying down. She goes out on a rampage mm -hmm. and makes sure justice is served. Do, what do you remember about Christian Slater? Such a kind, fun, sweet soul. Do you ever talk to him anymore? You... Not now as much, no. But you back in the day you did. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, and he's such a talented actor. And his mother, Mary Jo Slater, was a casting mm-hmm. agent, and she's cast me in things over the years. So, I yeah. worked with Christian for a year on the show. He was always great, yeah. great, great. To he's work a with. great guy. He was really he was like, "You're a little weird, Rosenbaum." <laughs> <laughs> you know? Wow. But I always made him laugh. Yeah. And like, I visited their set the second season because I didn't do the second season. I didn't want to do the second season, but I loved everybody, so I went back to visit. And he was directing the episode. And he, I remember he was just dealing with a lot of pain in the asses on yeah. set. And he came out to me and goes, I wish you were here, brother. Oh, but sweet. But you're lucky you're not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, He's such a good Ray guy. Ray H., what kind of stunts were you doing as Supergirl? Did any of them feel dangerous? Oh, well, learning to fly was a little bit dangerous. I had to be hoisted up on those piano wires up into the sky and... Yeah, that first time when they're pulling you up like 60 feet in the air, oh. I remember singing Hello, Dolly, quietly to myself, like just, just as I'm seeing the concrete floor get Well, further, to you and the sound away. guy. Yeah. He's hearing it. We weren't filming yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was what we were learning <laughs> when I was learning. That'd be very odd. Yeah. Um, Raj, tell me about a time when you uh, succeeded when others thought you would fail. That's a good question, Raj. Thank you. Yeah, Raj. I can't think of a time when I knew that other people thought I was going to fail, so I don't quite know how to answer it. But if I get an answer, I'll come back to it. All right. Um, lastly, did you ever? Lastly. Well, not lastly, but I mean, pretty much lastly. I mean, we, yeah, you know, this is great. Right. It just feels like I'm like, wow, time has flown. But um, you don't seem like anybody, someone who would get anxiety, someone who would deal with depression, somebody who like you've had a strong, you know, you know, head on your shoulders and you know, um, good upbringing, but people get anxiety and depression Definitely. for all sorts of reasons and some genetic whatever but did you ever have to deal with that i have definitely weathered feeling very anxious at times i mean i've never been diagnosed with a clinical anxiety problem right. or clinical depression but i certainly have been through periods where this adrenalized feeling where there's a feeling like of being terrorized by something or gripped by something and uh almost like my fingers in an electric socket. Like I just wanted to change the narrative and not keep, without going into details, it was in a relationship that was too becoming too confrontational all the time. And I just started to see like, for my mental health, it just was not, it was healthier to take a step back and have some space. And what, what do you do now if you're feeling anxious? Or- what are the things that you do? I mean, the other, you? my other wonderful image is like, I've said to my therapist, like, I'm like a cat up on the ceiling. Like, where's Helen? Then like, you look up and she's like, got all four things. She's up on the ceiling. Like, come down, shh, 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 come down. Um, you know, I meditate and I am a big yoga pra- practitioner and I do hike every single day. And every I, day you hike. And I think, I mean, if I were to die tomorrow and leave one thing to my daughter or to anyone that would be halfway interested, it would be like, get yourself in nature as much as possible. I don't care if you have to like drive to the beach or get on the hike or look at a tree, just keep putting your eyes and your nervous system in nature. Huh. Interesting. I mean, what if like... I like nature. <laughs> Are you Woody Allen in this way? <laughs> it scares me that you're like, this is what you need to do. I don't hike a lot. Um, I'm not like What a, do you like to do? You like to play golf? I like to play competitive sports, whether I'm playing tennis or golf or softball or hockey. Oh, dear. I like to play sports. I like to watch movies. I like to play games. I like to um, go out to eat with friends. Do you like to go in the ocean? Do you surf or... I like to go in the ocean if it's really warm. I don't like really cold, freezing oceans. Yeah. That's not really appealing to me. And I don't like being too hot. (laughs) There's nothing worse. I think basically you're describing an infant. (laughs) I don't mean to like get to. It's just. I mean, look, this is also therapy for me. This is why I have you on the show. Um, I mean, but look, I, I get what you're saying. And I do like nature. I I, I yeah. do things that I are, can't say it's prescriptive for everybody. I just know that there's no downside. How about absolutely, that? Absolutely, absolutely. There's no da- And plus, we want to interrupt these habits of mind that are just 
nightmares on yeah. our system. And going into a park or looking at a tree or like right now, things are blooming everywhere on Fryman Canyon, everywhere. It's mm. all starting to go. You just... Just to look at it is going to do something to the nervous system. You know what else it is? I like to do things with people. I like to, if, if, for instance, my friend Tom and Ethan and Ryan said, hey, we're going on a hike. It's not that long of a hike. It's just kind of like an you hour. You would do it because it's with your friends. Yeah, that sounds like fun. But me just getting up and going on an hour hike it just seems Annie Lamott has a great line about that. My mind is like a bad neighborhood. I don't want to visit it alone. At night, my, a bad neighborhood at night. I don't like to go there alone. Yeah, I think that's probably me. <laughs> this has been an absolute joy. You're a joy. Thank you I, so much. I love much. this. It's just so it's so easy talking to you. You're, you, you comfort me. Thank you. you. Make, well, you're worth being comforted. Thank you. And you and you make me you make me think. You make me sort of reevaluate some things that I think need to be reevaluated in my life. And uh, you're doing great. You got a smiley face on your cap. I do. Got you're Ryan bringing right people here. into your home. You've got the fabulous Ryan. You're being, <laughs> you're finding fellowship. That's like you. And by the way, fellowship and circling up as a guy, having male friends and being, that's huge. Thank I really you. commend that. That thing of like being in relation with other guys and having friendships. That's a big, big piece to the puzzle. Thanks. Uh, is your daughter an actress? Hannah. She's a writer. Hannah's a writer. Yeah. She doesn't want to act. She went to Tish. She did the acting mm. program there. She would in her own stuff, but yeah. Now she's a COVID captain on the Eddie Murphy movie. They have night shoots going on, and she's telling people to put their masks on. Really? <laughs> awesome. She's very funny. Thank you Thank for you, being Michael. here. Thank you, Michael. This has been a Ryan. treat. You guys are great. You're great. She was awesome. I loved having her on the show. She was so calm, which made me calm. It was just, she was very just, hey, let's just have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I love that. They're not anticipating. They're just here. They're present. She's very present. And I'm sure that's taken a lot of time and work on herself. Or maybe she's just been like that her whole life. Uh, thanks for listening again. Subscribe if you really like the podcast. Write a review. Join patreon.com slash inside of you to get back to the podcast. Um, you can listen to all that other stuff in the beginning. And thanks, Helen Slater, for being here. Bryce, thanks for being here. Yeah, How's the course. baby? How's Beckham? Good. He's uh, becoming a toddler, and it's <laughs> getting more fun. It's, it's harder, but it's more fun. There's not You can't just like put him down and go run to do something real quick and come back because he's moving constantly. Why did you name him Beckham? Uh, we just like the name. It wasn't after the soccer player. No, I don't. Soccer's fine. I, I didn't play soccer growing up. I don't really care about it at all. Don't care about Beckham's David a cool Beckham. name. We like it. It's a just lot. like a girl would be like, "Oh, Beckham." Mm -hmm. Ooh, I'm going out with Beckham. That's why we did it. I'm going out. With, and it sounds like a sports name. Now up to the plate, number seven, Beckham Mallers. I think he has to play soccer. Ooh, I don't know because he's, I mean, he's getting the shadow. Oh, look, that's Beckham. Like he's you no can't Beckham. name your kid Kobe and he doesn't play basketball. It's ridiculous. Mm, I don't know, man. <laughs> all right uh, we love you guys thanks for listening um and uh let's give a shout let's give our shout yes. outs our top tier patrons these are them these are the ones a lot of perks with patron if you're if you're listening for the first time um i do youtube lives uh with with the patrons um i send boxes to the top tiers every couple of months with a personalized note um we do a lot of stuff and there's more stuff coming you get to ask questions on the podcast and blah 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 inside of you is uh is 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 successful because of patron patreon.com slash inside you let's get the shout outs nancy d leah s and Kristen k little lisa yukiko jill e brian h nico p robert b jason w sophie m raj c raj told me to watch an animated movie and i was like no thanks it was like what a, was it i don't know i don't like um what's it called Claymation? No, not anime. Uh, I'm not really beginning to anime. Anime? Like anime. Oh. I've just never been yeah, into never anime. I just never got into it. Yeah. So when people tell me to watch it, I just... I should probably watch Spider Universe or whatever, Spider Verse. Yeah, I've heard good things about that. But I again, I'm just, it either. doesn't appeal to me. I like real, tangible mm -hmm. pe like people. But not Succession. 
Succession is just too dysfunctional for me in my dysfunctional life. I don't want to be more depressed. Joshua D, Jennifer N, Stacy L, Jamal F, Janelle B, Mike E, El Dan Supremo, 99 more. Uh, you know who I miss? Ramira. She's not on here anymore. Oh, Remember Ramira? Yeah. Yeah. San Diego M. San Diego M made that statue, the bust. He also made the little bust that I was uh, putting on the pot on the uh, Inside You online mm-hmm. store. And those were purchased really fast. He's doing a sorority boys one of Adina. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So he's going to do some of those and he's doing another Lex Luthor figure. So he's a man. Yeah. San Diego M, Chad W, Leanne P, Maddie S, Belinda N, Dave H, Dave Hall. Hello, Dave. Sheila G, Brad D, Ray H, Ha Da Da, Tab of the T, Tom N. What's up, Tom? Old Tommy boy. Talia M, Betsy D. I miss Betsy D and Talia. All of you, Angel M, Rhiannon C, Corey K, Dev Nexon, Michelle A, Jeremy C, Brandy D, Yavor, Joey M, Eugene and Leah, Corey, Jake B, Eugene and Leah, how's the baby? I hope well. I hope not crying all the time like they did at the con that time. Angela F, Mel S, Christine S, Eric H, Shane R, Andrew M, Tim L, Amanda R, Jen B, Kevin E, Stephanie K, Jarrell, Jammin J, Leanne J, Luna R, Mike F, Stonehenge, Stone H, Brian L, Kendall L, Meredith I, Kara K, C, Jessica B, Kyle F, Marisol P, Esteban G, Kaylee J, Brian A, Ashley F, Marion Louise L, Romeo B, Veronica Q, Frank B, Jen T, Nikki L, April R, Cassie B, and Derek N. Couldn't do it without any of you. Uh, we love you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting. And uh, without further ado, I am Michael Rosenbaum from the Hollywood Hills in California. I'm Ryan Teos. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> I'm Bryce. From the Hollywood Hills. From the Hollywood Hills of California? Yeah, that's it. A little wave of the camera. I don't know the sign off. That's all right. We love you guys. Um, Thanks for listening and be good to yourself. We'll see you.